Chapter 76 Inch Thank you all for such a warm welcome, said Professor Millay, the summoning magic professor, as she entered the classroom, puzzled by the heated atmosphere. Despite her advanced age, Professor Millay, who maintained a dignified posture, was unmistakably a noble from a prestigious imperial family, evident to anyone who saw her. Nobility from great families always had a way of standing out, even in their walk and talk, though, those from the Blue Dragon are somewhat an exception. Of course, the students trapped and starving in the tower were exceptions, whether noble or not, dignity fades when one is possessed by hunger. Professor Millay slightly adjusted her monocle, her demeanor that of a strict perfectionist, but Ihan was not intimidated. Anyone is better than Professor Bellotti, he mused. Professor Garcia began a brief explanation, like dark magic. Formal summoning magic class is also taught from the second year, however. The reason for inviting Professor Millay today is not only a great opportunity to learn what summoning magic is but also, just then, a summoned creature that had escaped from the academy grounds held outside, causing the windows to tremble. Considering the current situation of the Academy? I thought it would be helpful for all of you, concluded Professor Garcia. Professor Garcia. We have no one but you, Professor. Some students took out handkerchiefs to wipe their tears. Professor Millay watched this display without a change in her expression and then spoke in a firm voice Professor Garcia, shall we begin? Yes, please start. Who among you is interested in summoning magic? All the students raised their hands, including Ihan. He couldn't understand why Professor Mortem's sad face briefly crossed his mind, but summoning magic is truly wonderful, he thought, like dark magic, which varied from curses, elemental summons, undead raising, to negative energy, summoning magic. Encompassed numerous fields, elemental summoning demon summoning, monster summoning, artifact summoning, magic object summoning, and more, as a magic that included a variety of entities, from living beings to inanimate objects, even overlapping with dark magic to some extent, its utility was boundless, old tales often spoke of mages who lived happily ever after, and lazily, by contracting with an exceptional summon, while not all aspects of these tales were believable, they indicated how. Prosperous one could become with mastery in summoning magic, thank you, however, there may be at most one student here who is qualified to learn summoning magic, silence fell in the classroom. Professors had a knack for dampening spirits, and Professor Millay was no exception, she continued sternly, I will not mince words, summoning magic is difficult, if you lack the ability to learn and attend the second year class unnecessarily, it will be hard on the student. Now that's a professor, Ihan was impressed. If a student lacks the ability to learn, a professor should discourage or wait for them, rather than thinking, why can't they learn? Let's see if they can't learn even before they die. If you think that, aren't you a gangster, not a professor? Summoning magic isn't something you can learn with just knowledge in one area of magic. To summon spirits, you need a deep understanding of spirit studies. To summon demons, a deep understanding of demonology, to summon monsters, a deep understanding of monster studies, even inanimate object summoning, which is relatively easy, is not simple, so I say it again, if you're not confident, it's better not to take an interest in summoning magic, yet, the students seemed even more intrigued, given their young age, how many would retreat just because it was difficult? They all looked more eager now. This was the complete opposite of dark magic, which they had been indifferent to despite it being deemed easy. Professor Garcia whispered softly, They are all talented students, would you give them a chance? Professor Millay nodded her head in agreement, with a flick of her staff, strange geometrically patterned magic circle scrolls appeared in front of the students, unlike disposable scrolls that activated upon tearing. These were fixed scrolls with magic circles drawn on their open surfaces. You all are taking basic imperial geometry and arithmetic, aren't you? Yes, they replied, hearing the name of the class. The students' faces twisted as if they had just bitten into frogs. 
enduring the torture of those dreadful numbers was not something many students could handle, not being magic or liberal. Arts, honestly, that's one of the easier subjects, Badi Han, swallowing the thought that would have earned him astoning had his friends heard it, it's too difficult. Then you have no chance of learning summoning magic, upon uttering those words and risking elimination from learning summoning magic, Ganondo closed his mouth. Pay attention in basic imperial geometry and arithmetic. The creation and calculation of magic circles are essential in summoning magic. Ihan examined the magic circle, unlike Ganondo, whose eyes were spinning in confusion. Ihan could discern what type of magic circle it was, so, the mana flows like this? Magic circles were akin to circuits. While electrical circuits conducted electricity, magic circles conducted mana. Any mage who had cast magic knew how difficult it was. The higher the complexity of the magic, the greater the difficulty, the required amount of mana increased, and the structure of the magic became more complex. Magic at a certain level was not deemed humanly possible without reason. These magic circles aided the mages, amplifying in some parts, reducing in others. Bypassing or blocking in various ways, they circulated mana to alleviate the mage's burden, while calculating the circulating mana and visualizing it in his mind, Ihan suddenly saw a vision of a quill, what's this? In the world of magic, there were no coincidences, Ihan realized that the quill he just envisioned was related to the magic circle, this magic circle summons a quill, a quill? To summon a quill? The students were perplexed, summoning a quill, rather than something like a dagger, left them wondering, why bother? Ihan shook his head in disbelief, ungrateful lot, would they take responsibility if Professor Millay were to behave like Professor Bolotti? What if she cleared the desks and threw a demon summoning circle at them, saying, if you don't want to die, succeed in summoning, fortunately? Professor Millay was different, she spoke in her unchanged, firm voice, it's a magic quill made of mana, it won't last long once summoned, so focus only on the act of summoning for now. No sooner had the professor finished speaking than the students started waving their staffs, activating the magic circles, come forth, quill. Magic quill, please appear. With each incantation, magic circles flared up or scrolls tore apart, though made to withstand mana. These magic circles could easily break and crumble due to a mage's mistake. As Professor Millay had anticipated this, she waved his staff. As the damaged magic circles vanished, new ones appeared. About thirty minutes had passed. Students from various groups began successfully summoning objects resembling Quill, the Blue Dragon, with Yonair, Aiden Art, and Aeson, had the most successful summonings followed by decent numbers from the black tortoise and the immortal phoenix, the white tiger had the least, but still, a few talented students managed to summon something akin to Quill, observing the beaming students, Professor Garcia. Couldn't help but give a bitter smile, they shouldn't be pleased with just that, indeed, Professor Millie's face remained as impassive and rigid as a statue, the challenge of summoning magic lay exactly in this. Somewhat successful, summoning was as good as a failure. Elemental magic might count as a success despite differences in size or shape, but summoning magic was the complete? complete? Opposite, if it wasn't perfect, it was meaningless, it couldn't be helped, since summoning involved imbuing will into the summoned object. Any slight mistake could lead the summon to attack themage. At least it was just a quill, Dargard, you scoundrel. You attacked me with a magic quill. It's a misunderstanding, Ganondo. The quill moved on its own. Besides, it's just a quill. Assassination of royalty. It's an assassination, Ihan, help me. It's just a quill, how likely is it to kill someone? The quill was indeed enough to cause an uproar, on Lego of the White Tiger, belonging to the prestigious Alpha family felt a proud thrill as a sleek quill materialized, although he felt behind in various magics due to his family status, summoning magic seemed different, perhaps he was even better than Jigil? 
Seeing Ihan seated in front of him without a quill or anything else, Onlego couldn't hide his smugness. For the first time, I could defeat the notorious young mage from the Wardenaz family, thought Onlego, calling out to Ihan, Wardenaz, have you failed in summoning? Silence from Ihan, Wardenaz. Don't ignore me. Look at my quill. Yonair, sitting nearby, retorted, didn't you have a quill at home? Bragging about a quill? Look at my quill here, bang. A loud noise erupted? On Lego, thinking Ihan had invoked dark magic, duffed to the ground in fear, magic quills began to materialize in droves above Ihan's magic circle. Ihan looked at the fluttering quills with a bemused expression, a failure. He hadn't heard Anglego's taunts. He was too focused. Channeling mana into the fragile magic circle to complete the summoning was difficult for the other students, but for Ihan, it was excruciatingly hard. A moment's loss of control could tear the magic circle apart. With a surge of mana, thus, Ihan had almost given up when everyone else began. Maybe summoning magic isn't my forte. Perhaps Ihan's destiny was to be a battle mage like Professor Bolotti? But, surprisingly, the magic circle didn't break, even Ihan was astonished, was I capable of this? A perfect understanding of the magic circle, and recently, forcibly, improved mana control, when these two merged, Ihan managed not to destroy the magic circle, it was an astonishing achievement, oh, right, the task was to summon, engrossed in successfully channeling mana into the magic circle without breaking it, Ihan continued to do so until he realized his mistake, the task had been to summon a magic quill, not to keep the magic circle intact, a pure quill, Ihan murmured simply and swung his staff, bang. In that moment, with a loud noise, magic quills began to materialize in abundance above the magic circle, surprised by this unusual failure phenomenon which she had never seen before. Professor Garcia turned her gaze aside, it seemed like the first time Professor Millie's eyebrows had risen so high, student Ihan originally has so much mana, so such failures, before Professor Garcia could finish her excuse, Professor Millie returned her expression to normal and calmly stated, That's not a failure, Professor Garcia. Chapter 77 Inches The World of Summoning Magic Failure was defined as when the result was even 1% different from the intended target. However, the magic quills now fluttering and falling from the air were a perfect match for their intended targets. The only issue was their excessive number. Professor Garcia quickly understood this and nodded in agreement. That's right, it's not a failure, she acknowledged. The troll professor sighed in slight relief, although it was her role as a professor. To care equally for all students, she couldn't help but worry a bit more about the boy from the Wardeness family. The boy's inherent mana was so immense that even basic spells became challenging for him. Fortunately, Ihan, unlike a typical freshman, was bravely and steadfastly facing the challenges with a bold and steadfast posture. Still, Professor Garcia felt a pang of guilt. It was, after all, a teacher's duty to provide solutions to such problems. Professor Garcia, unable to find a proper solution, was the only one among the faculty of the Magic Academy who felt a sense of guilt. Ihan is quite talented, isn't he? Seeing his perfect success, Professor Garcia started. Professor Millay nodded in response to Garcia's remark. He is indeed talented. Do you think so too? Professor Garcia, well aware of the difficulty of summoning magic and Professor Millie's strictness, felt that Millie's recognition was all the more valuable. He has the talent for summoning magic, but there is one flaw, Millie pointed out. What might that be? Garcia asked, slightly puzzled, not his mana, Professor Garcia, then what? His flaw is arrogance, Millie revealed, arrogance? Garcia was momentarily taken aback. Indeed, the boy from the Wardenaz family might appear arrogant at first glance. His cold, marble-like appearance, combined with the dignity of a high noble, made him seem unapproachable to most. But Garcia knew well that Ihan was not such a boy. 
After all, a student who personally took care of his fellow students at the Blue Dragon couldn't have such an arrogant nature. There seems to be a misunderstanding, observe carefully, Professor Garcia, Millet instructed, pointing to the numerous magic quills, the student succeeded in one try, yet, he intentionally summoned dozens of magic quills, what does that imply? A single successful summoning meant a high understanding of magic circles and control over mana, it was rare for a freshman to possess both knowledge and talent. Objectively, such abilities qualified a student to enter the world of summoning magic, but why did such a student intentionally summon dozens of magic quills? If he had the capability to succeed on the first attempt, one would have sufficed, there was only one answer, to arrogantly show off his skills, no, Garcia was taken aback by Milia's words, Ihan is not of such character, arrogance is a necessary virtue for a mage but it's a dangerous poison if possessed from too young an age, especially if one has innate knowledge and talent, said Professor Millet, that's... Um, Professor Garcia stuttered, her face flushing with embarrassment, Professor Millet's eyebrows rose, sensing Garcia's unease, not all relationships among professors were equal, especially when one was a former student of another, nevertheless, Garcia wanted to clear up the misunderstanding, I don't think Ihan has such a character, it might have been a mistake, a mistake? Milia's voice carried a hint of incredulity, a bad sign, so, you're saying that the summoning was a mistake? Professor Garcia? Summoning multiple quills with that magic circle wasn't as simple as just infusing several times the mana needed for a single quill, if the power input recklessly increased, the circle could either be destroyed or backfire. Once mana was introduced into the circuit, its properties changed, necessitating recalculations for each new infusion of power. The only way to summon multiple quills was to repeat the process meticulously. Maybe he practiced first to avoid destroying the magic circle. And forgot about the residual mana in it? Milia's stern gaze softened, looking almost pitifully at her well-meaning disciple. A student as talented as him wouldn't forget something like that? Professor Garcia, Garcia fell silent, having no response, she felt her excuse was weak, but she strongly believed in the possibility of a mistake, it's good to trust and love your students, Professor Garcia, but you shouldn't turn a blind eye to their faults or mistakes, sometimes, affection and trust can blind us, yes, I'm not denying the student's talent, but arrogance can harm him, so be careful, Millet advised. Understood. Don't worry so much, if he learns summoning magic, he'll soon correct his arrogance, summoning magic always humbled those who considered themselves supreme geniuses, combined with Milia's strictness, any uncontrollable arrogance would soon be reduced to a healthy level of self-esteem, Garcia turned away, watching Ihan sending the summoned quills to Onlego and writing with them the sentence, I don't have a quill, this act sparked a brawl between the students of the White Tiger and the Blue Dragon, heading to intervene, Garcia couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't arrogance after all? No matter how much I think about it, I don't think that's really true, the commotion had finally subsided, the faces of the students were smeared unevenly with ink, remnants left behind by the imperfectly and perfectly summoned magic quills, although the summoned quills vanished over time, the ink they left behind did not. I believe you all have gained some understanding of how difficult summoning magic can be. The magic practice today is just the basics of basics, and ideally, it should be performed without a magic circle. Professor Millet instilled fear in the students, yet continued earnestly without heed. If you are truly interested in summoning magic and wish to learn it seriously, please visit my workshop. Remember, it's a common misconception that talent or intelligence is necessary for mastering magic. Ihan felt Professor Millie's gaze momentarily on him. Was it just his imagination? Was it a problem that I made the quills pester on Lego? What's most needed is perseverance and patience. If you continue without giving up and immerse yourself earnestly, summoning magic will open a path for you. With that, Professor Millet finished her speech and left the classroom. The remaining students huddled together, murmuring. 
Should we visit the workshop? Didn't the professor say it? It's hard to catch up if you start only in the second year. Seems like it's essential to start practicing summoning magic from the first year. The students nodded in agreement, having attempted to summon a quill themselves. They now understood the difficulty of summoning magic, the act of summoning an object to move on its own through a mage's power. But can we really go to the professor now and learn summoning magic separately? Why not? Really? We already have so much homework, and more will be added, not to mention preparing for upcoming exams. Can we really study summoning magic on top of all that? Their realistic concerns intimidated the students. As attractive as summoning magic was, not many could handle the increase in assignments it entailed. That's why you should take easy classes. Ihan thought this but then reflected on his choice, hadn't he, in seeking an easy course? Now found himself in a life-threatening situation, Ihan grew curious about what elective courses the other students were taking. What electives are you guys taking? Me? Basic art, everyone's taking it, right? I'm in basic dance and socializing, it's practically a semi-mandatory course, I'm taking understanding basic empire masterpieces, I want to buy one during the vacation. Ihan was slightly taken aback by his friend's course selections. Was he the only one lacking in general education? There's no course without assignments. Same here. But that doesn't mean I can skip summoning magic? Unless the academy lends us an artifact to turn back time, Gainondo, that's a fairy tale. Such a thing doesn't exist, even if it did. Do you think they'd lend it to a student for attending classes? It would be used for far more important purposes. Listening to his friends, Ihan checked the time and stood up. Gainondo, let's go. Where to? And why are you taking Gainondo? Using him as bait for a summoned creature? No, I need to meet Professor Mortem. While everyone was deliberating whether to go for summoning magic, a professor was left desolate and ignored, having almost no students interested in his class. This was Professor Mortem, who taught dark magic. Since Professor Mortem had directly called out their names, Ihan and Gainondo had no choice but to visit him periodically to learn dark magic. Unlike the other students, do you really have to go? Can't you just send Gainondo alone? The friends were reluctant to send Ihan, but Gainondo had no intention of going alone. If I end up going alone, I'll recommend all of you, Gainondo. My noble friend. It seems there's been a misunderstanding. The friends quickly changed their stance, Yonair asked as if to check. Do you think it'll be all right? Students interested in summoning magic might be going now. There's no set time, so after seeing Professor Mortem, we can go together to see the summoning magic. Ihan was interested in summoning magic too. It was just that he had a prior engagement. It was best not to break appointments with professors, especially if that professor was lonely, lacking students to seek. Then, see you next time, take care, Wardenaz. Be careful of the released summoned creatures, and don't forget. The potion priestess Sienna gave you, be careful with Professor Mortem, and you, Gainondo? Moved by Aeson's words, Gainondo showed a slightly touched expression, Dargard, be careful because if Gainondo makes a mistake, you'll be in danger too. The warning was not for Gainondo to be careful, but for Ihan to be wary of Gainondo. Upon meeting Professor Mortem, Gainondo resolved to recommend Aeson. Chapter 78 Darkness Chamber The tower, used as a workshop by Professor Mortem, remained ominously dreary. If we want more students to come, we should probably start by improving the surroundings. Skulls, bones, tombstones, and boxes of lethal potions scattered around were generally not inviting. To Ihan's eyes, it seemed that among the new students, only he and Gainondo would be interested in learning dark magic. Ihan was surprised, there was another new student in front of the darkness chamber. And not just one, but two. Why on earth are those kids here to learn dark magic? Is there a reason to be so serious? Ihan was puzzled by Gainondo's reaction. Gainondo replied as if it were obvious, 
Didn't the professor say I was the only one with talent? Didn't you say you don't like dark magic? Ihan tried to say something, but then gave up and changed the subject. Gainondo, even if they're not as talented as you, they might still want to learn dark magic. That's true. Gainondo slightly regretted his earlier attitude. Perhaps he had been too harsh? Hey, everyone, don't pretend to be friendly with me, you blue dragon scum. Gainondo, in a fit of anger, was about to strike with his staff but Ihan held him back, student from the White Tiger? That's right, the student's eyes shimmered faintly with a golden light, with his somewhat exotic features, Ihan realized that the student was of mixed blood, an angel mixed blood? Yes, descended from glorious ancestors, for something he is proud of, the blood seems quite diluted. Tigiling, a demon mixed blood, had such rich blood that one could tell just by looking at her. In contrast, this white tiger student was much harder to recognize. Without Ihan's keen senses, it would have been difficult to notice, descended from glorious ancestors, yet you follow the orders of the Maradi family? Ihan immediately tried to sow discord. The fewer white tiger students who followed Jigil's orders, the more comfortable life would be for Ihan and Daljiu. A knight's honor and pride were easy targets. Don't be mistaken, Warden as. I, Raphael, do not heed Morata's commands? What? You don't follow Morata's orders, yet why are you so agger, igno, insol, unable to find the right word? Ihan just ended his question, why do you act that way? You really don't know? Raphael looked at Ihan incredulously, it was absurd to him to act like a fool, Gainanda whispered from the side. Remember when we sent those white tiger guys to the punishment room? Just for that? Or maybe because we snuck into the lounge and stole their flag? Just for that? Gainanda was perplexed. Huh, isn't that reason enough? Raphael narrowed his eyes at Ihan, Dalju of the Choi family. You surely cannot feign ignorance now. It's the name of the noble friend you're wickedly toying with. Ihan was at a loss for words for the first time in a while. Gainondo came to his defense. No, look, Daljiu is our friend. How cowardly to make excuses. After assaulting and knocking him unconscious, you still claim to be friends. Gainondo looked at Ihan, seeking help. I treated Daljiu the same way because I was afraid he would be hated by the white tiger guys. Is that supposed to be an excuse? Raphael responded as if he was astounded, Ihan shrugged, as if he had expected such a reaction, some misunderstandings are just insurmountable, wait, you, you're from the Grau family, aren't you? Gainondo belatedly recalled Raphael's lineage, the Grau family, a knightly family from the south? Proud of their ancestral blood mixed with that of angels, the Grau family was known for their strict adherence to justice among knight families, judging by his speech, that's right, you evil bastards, it seemed that the student had already categorized Ihan and Gainondo as the epitome of evil, Ihan felt a twinge of regret, but it's mostly because of the reputation of the Wardeness family, if it weren't for the wild reputation of the Wardeness family, Ihan wouldn't have been misunderstood like this, at least, that's what he believed, why would someone from the Grau family learn dark magic? Gainondo challenged the notion as absurd. Why would someone from the Grau family, known for producing so many holy knights, come to learn dark magic? Raphael spoke confidently. Learning dark magic will help to better counter dark mages. The professor will cry. Ihan was lost for words. Out of just four new arrivals, one was a hater of dark magic. Indeed, Grau. You learn dark magic to counter dark mages? I thought you were here to conspire with Jigil Moradi against me. Don't compare me, Raphael, to that Moradi fellow. Raphael was visibly upset, while Ihan manipulated Daljiu like a puppet. Jigil's contemptible manipulation of other white tiger students was equally despicable. So, you won't join hands with Jigil of the Moradi family to plot against me? Of course not. And her lackeys? Absolutely. What are you asking? Then that's all? Ihan walked away as if he had said all he needed to, 
if Raphael wouldn't attack from behind or join hands with Jigil, whatever he blustered about up front didn't matter. Raphael blinked in confusion. What exactly had he been outwitted by? Following Ihan, Ganondo thought to himself, He's my friend, but he seems like a really evil great mage. Having been once mouthed by Raphael, Ganondo became quite hostile. He spoke to another student with undisguised harshness in his voice, Yr. You here to learn dark magic? Swoosh, dash. The student stood up. Only then did Ganondo realize the student had been sitting on the floor. Ihan was tall. But this student was so tall that even Ihan had to look up, easily over two meters tall, a giant mixed blood. Overwhelmed, Ganondo quickly became more respectful. You, you can learn, my apologies, hello, nice to meet everyone, the student was from the Black Tortoise, he looked around nervously as he greeted, my name is Amurg, I'm Ihan, this is Ganondo? But, why are you looking around? My, my friends don't like it when I mingle with students from the Blue Dragon. Ihan was surprised, well, that's not strange, excluding the immortal phoenix, tower students typically stuck together. It was natural, in a way, that students from the Black Tortoise, with hardly any nobles or knights among them, would dislike mingling with those from the knight-dominated White Tiger or the nobility-dominated Blue Dragon, Nilia, and Ratford was an exception. Still, Ihan, just to be sure, checked, you don't think I'm an evil mage, do you? Huh? What are you talking about? Never mind, that's fine then. Fortunately, the dislike was indeed due to nobility, Ihan felt relieved, I'm here because I'm interested in dark magic, I want to be friends with others who are learning it, humph. That won't happen. Raphael, standing behind, responded vehemently, he had no intention of befriending students who sought to learn evil dark magic, Emerg looked at Raphael with a sad expression, Raphael flinched, seemingly a bit frightened. Right. Maybe not outside, but let's be friends here, while learning dark magic, Ihan extended his hand, and Merck was an easy case to become very close with, after meeting so many odd characters at the academy, this was almost a relief, and Merck, with a delighted expression, grabbed Ihan's hand and shook it vigorously, in that moment, Ihan had to quickly muster all his mana to withstand it, ugh. Ihan managed his expression, not wanting to offend Emerg. The strength was immense, I'm also looking forward to it. Ganondo, clueless, extended his hand, Ihan, tried to stop him, but Ganondo had already grabbed it? Crack, Professor Mortem, seeing the increased number of new students, hummed a happy tune through his nose, Ihan felt a pang of guilt, I shouldn't sympathize with the professor, Stockholm Syndrome was a dangerous condition, cough, good to see you all. I didn't expect so many students interested in dark magic, I'm looking forward to next year, we're glad to be here. Professor Mortem seemed oblivious to Raphael's malevolent intent, he turned to Ihan, have you found any more bone summons? Not yet, cough, roam more in the dark and gloomy places, Professor Mortem winked at Ihan as if giving a gift, though it was hardly romantic. Roaming around the academy's dark and gloomy places looking for runaway summons, that's almost like a suicide mission. Cough, everyone must be eager for today's gathering, so let's proceed with the lesson quickly. Do you remember what we learned about curses last time? Yes, of course, Raphael took out paper and a quill, ready to jot down the professor's words. Professor Mortem looked pleased, of course, knowing Raphael's true intentions. Ihan could only feel sorry, aren't you going to attack the professor later, honestly, I found curses more interesting than summoning magic. Ganondo admitted honestly, today, let's not rush and deepen our understanding of curses, wait a moment, Professor Mortem paused mid-sentence, did you learn summoning magic this week? Yes, cough, how did the students react? Everyone liked it. Everyone but us went to the workshop to hear more about it. Ihan wanted to smack Ganondo, but unfortunately couldn't. Professor Mortem declared firmly, not curses then. Today, I'll teach you undead summoning. Wow. Is this really okay? 
Ehan felt uneasy. It seemed like they were skipping several steps in the curriculum. Cough, undead summoning is, you could say, the flower among flowers and summoning magic, perhaps the most beautiful? Complex and intricate magic. Where do typical dark mages acquire corpses for their magic? That's a good question, student Raphael. In the past, graveyards were commonly used, but nowadays, that's not the case. We acquire corpses with permission and use those. Oh, but I guess illegal dark mages still frequently use graveyards? I guess so. Thank you. Raphael, excited continued to take notes. Professor Mortem cocked his head, sensing something amiss. However, you lot are still too inexperienced to perform a completed undead summoning. A fully summoned undead, if mishandled, can kill the mage. A common dark magic mishap involved a bungling mage being killed by a skeletal warrior they had summoned, Ganondo, who had nearly been killed by a magic quill. Nodded in agreement, we'll start with the simplest, something that can't kill you, let's begin with summoning a bone hand, the students listened intently, their expressions tense. Swoosh, bone hands appeared in front of the students, first, try to befriend the bone hand, initially, it won't listen to you. Ihan momentarily thought the bone summons and the bone hand were switched, the bone hand was very respectfully bowing in front of him, is this a trap? Chapter 79 However, the behavior of the bone hand suggested something more than a mere trap. It was excessively polite. As Ihan stepped forward, the bone hand, trembling violently, rolled backward and lay down. Seemingly to prove its lack of hostile intent, Ihan was momentarily baffled. Just then, Professor Mortem interjected, Cough. It's easy to be deceived by the beautiful and majestic appearance of undead summoning. But in reality, it's anything but easy, this comment shed light. On a common dilemma faced by mages? Especially those who typically designed inanimate objects for summoning spells, they often pondered, must I summon inanimate objects? Can't I summon beings with a consciousness? Even the act of summoning a magic sword required careful pre-planning of its attributes and autonomous movements. As the complexity of such summoning spells increased, they demanded almost AI-like autonomy, making their study particularly challenging for mages. The questions persisted, why must we design every detail? Can't we just summon beings with consciousness from the start? However, summoning beings with consciousness had clear drawbacks. Such beings might not always obey the summoner's commands, and this was particularly true for undead monsters, compared to other monsters. Undead creatures were usually a bit more disobedient. Their fundamental nature was the root cause of this challenge. Summoners were mostly alive, while the undead were, well, dead. Forming a bond between such opposites was naturally difficult. To bridge this gap, dark mages employed various methods to befriend the undead, living in tombs, anointing themselves with rotting substances and wearing necklaces of bones and flesh were not signs of degeneracy, but rather heartbreaking efforts to mask the life force of the living and get closer to the undead. The students, listening intently to Professor Mortem's lecture on undead summoning, turned as pale as the undead creatures being discussed. Meanwhile, Professor Mortem, seemingly oblivious to their discomfort, continued, cough, so, Try to befriend the bone hand by any means necessary, if you get close to it, eventually you'll be able to befriend other undead monsters. He explained that getting close to low-tier undead monsters like the bone hand could imbue one's soul with their aura, thus enabling control over more powerful undead over time, Professor? Ihan interjected, quietly waiting for a pause in the lecture. He raised his hand and called out to Professor Mortem. Are there undead who are particularly cowardly? He asked. This was an unusual question, as undead monsters were typically characterized by their fearlessness, given their lack of life. Professor Mortem initially scoffed at the notion, as if to dismiss such a possibility, but then his expression changed to one of surprise upon noticing the undead monster, the bone hand, trembling in front. 
of Ehan, Professor Mortem cast an incredulous look at the bone hand he had summoned, wondering if this was its usual reaction when confronted with students. The bone hand, seemingly ashamed, bowed its head in front of the professor, can't you get closer quickly? Professor Mortem commanded, yet the bone hand remained trembling, hesitant to approach Ehan. The professor began to wonder if there was an issue with the potion he used in the summoning. Meanwhile, another bone hand was happily slapping the cheek of an approaching student, Ginando. They all seemed to behave normally, except for the one in front of Ihan. Did the bone hand feel a kinship due to Ihan being accompanied by a bone summon? No, that shouldn't cause fear, the professor thought. Only one conclusion seemed plausible, and it left Professor Mortem internally horrified. Could it be? Cough, try summoning it yourself, he suggested to Ihan, is that all right? Ihan asked, yes, dark magic is superior to summoning magic because it offers practical experience like this. With summoning magic, you'd only be studying for a year? Professor Mortem, eager to demonstrate the efficacy of dark magic, tossed Ihan a bone fragment necessary for the spell and etched a magic circle on the ground. Ihan, holding his staff and focusing intently, couldn't shake off a sense of unease about the professor's actions. It seems like he's rushing the curriculum to prove dark magic is better, he thought. However, Ihan felt confident in his ability to subdue the bone hand if it turned aggressive. He began the incantation. Appear, bone hand. With a throw of the bone fragment and a swing of his staff? The fragment absorbed mana and transformed amidst ominous smoke into a bone hand, this was not one of the bone hands previously summoned and controlled by Professor Mortem, this was a new entity, conjured by Ihan himself, summoning spells typically acted like chains restraining a beast, and for a novice mage, handling such a chain was a significant challenge, the incantation controlled the undead monster, but the control was precarious for an inexperienced caster. Professor Mortem. Observed the situation closely, if the newly summoned bone hand broke free and attacked Ihan, he was prepared to reverse the summoning immediately, however, what unfolded was unexpected, rolling and tumbling, the new bone hand, summoned by Ihan, displayed an even greater level of submission than the one summoned by Professor. Mortem. This surprising behavior was in stark contrast to what might be expected of a freshly summoned undead entity. It was as if the bone hand was showing an exaggerated form of obedience. Amidst this scene, the bone summon hanging from Ihan's belt writhed, seemingly in jealousy. You have too much mana, Professor Mortem stated calmly, shedding light on a peculiarity he had observed in Ihan. Reflecting on past events, Ihan realized there had been indications of this since the Curse class, he hadn't comprehended the severity of his condition, not until seeing the undead monsters cower and submit before him. Ihan, feeling like a patient diagnosed with an incurable disease, asked solemnly, I see, Professor, is there a way to cure this? Cough, why cure it? It's a blessed talent, Professor Mortem responded, surprising Ihan. Ihan was taken aback. He had always considered his excessive mana a hindrance. Magic was hard to use, spirits fled from him, and now, even undead creatures were showing fear. Cough, with such a talent, there's no need to befriend undead monsters, just suppress them with power. What a wonderful ability, Professor Mortem elaborated. He explained that dark mages didn't indulge in rituals like rolling around in tombs for enjoyment, they did it to somehow befriend the undead. However, if one could simply overpower them instead of befriending them, it would be a more efficient method of control. To Professor Mortem, the ability to subjugate undead monsters seemed a more advanced and desirable form of control, but Professor, we can summon and subjugate undead monsters, but not spirits, Ihan pointed out. Without first befriending spirits, they wouldn't respond to summons, rendering the idea of intimidating them moot. Professor Mortem, understanding Ihan's concern, kindly offered a solution. Cough? There's a good solution, what is it? Ihan inquired, intrigued, just give up on summoning spirits. Professor Mortem advised, Ihan was grateful for the table's presence, 
hidden beneath it, he could clench his fist without anyone noticing his frustration. However, Professor Mortem was earnest in his advice. Cough, why try to graze on grass with such good teeth and claws? Dark magic suits you best. I don't usually say this, but you have a genius talent for dark magic? The professor declared, Ah, I see, Ehan responded nonchalantly. This time, it was Professor Mortem who was taken aback by Ehan's indifferent reaction. The professor had given a rare and valuable compliment, yet Ehan seemed too casual about it. Perhaps due to his warden's family lineage, Ehan's response was unexpectedly indifferent. The time to be swayed by professor's praise has passed, Ehan thought. He knew that professors often used praise strategically, especially in less popular fields, and being beguiled by it could complicate one's life. Seeking to shift the focus, Ehan mentioned, however, Professor, due to the amount of mana, casting spells is difficult for me, that will improve with practice, cough, I'll help you with the training, Professor Mortem offered, damn, professors are really of no help, Ehan thought privately, they seemed more interested in satisfying their own desires than genuinely assisting students, could a professor really be this self-serving? But then again, professors had always been like this? Oh my, thank you very much, Ehan replied, managing to keep his expression neutral. While he hadn't committed to pursuing dark magic, he recognized the need to prepare for the possibility that other magics might fail him, leaving dark magic as his only viable option. Therefore, maintaining a good relationship with Professor Mortem was pragmatic, as they exchanged smiles. Both the professor and student had their own hidden agendas, elsewhere in the classroom, Gainondo, with a swollen cheek, angrily confronted a bone hand with his staff, Raphael, equally battered, brandished a wooden sword at another bone hand. Emerg, the only one in skate, had managed to grab and pin down a charging bone hand, catching Ehan's disbelief, Professor Mortem elaborated, cough. Having a talent for dark magic doesn't mean one quickly befriends the undead, that's not a good method, it's a classic mistake young dark mages make, but if you beat them up like that, won't the undead monsters start respecting the summoner? Ehan asked, trying to understand the dynamics, Professor Mortem looked at Ehan as if he were suggesting something absurd, Ehan, feeling misunderstood, thought, but you said suppression was a good method? After the extra lesson, Gainondo, nursing his swollen cheek with the ointment provided by Professor Mortem, couldn't hide his irritation, undead monsters, they're unaware of nobility, Ihan? Ihan looked at him questioningly, let's hurry to the summoning magic class, it might be better if it's not undead monsters? Gainondo suggested, hoping for a change in their magic studies, Ihan pondered silently, apart from spirits. Demons are probably more ferocious than undead monsters, and monsters generally have strong wild instincts, he thought. Meanwhile, Raphael, sporting a puffed-up face, couldn't contain his frustration. You wicked dark mage, just you wait, I'll be watching you. He yelled at Ihan, really, it seems we have a misunderstanding. Do we really have to fight as fellow dark magic students? Ihan questioned, seeking to defuse the situation, you jerk. You hit me in the face earlier. Raphael accused, that was a mistake, Ihan replied, regretting the incident, Ihan, following Professor Mortem's guidance, had been testing how far he could command the undead monster. He had even successfully executed a difficult command to self-destruct, which earned him applause and admiration from the professor, however, Amidst a command error, Ihan's summoned bone hand accidentally slapped Raphael, leading to his grudge against the wicked necromancer. Really, why don't you believe me? Ihan lamented, Ihan, he's already gone, Gainondo pointed out. What a pity, Ihan responded, a hint of regret in his voice. Gainondo looked at Ihan, his gaze mixed with fear. So this is why the undead obey well? He wondered, emerg. See you next class, Ihan said, bidding farewell to another classmate. Uh, okay, Ihan, but not outside, Emerg replied cautiously, hinting at a certain unease around Ihan. 
Ihan felt a sting of hurt at Amurg's words but chose not to show it. Spirit Festival Hall The Spirit Festival Hall, a workshop and tower used by Professor Millay, radiated an aura starkly different from that of the darkness chamber. It's like a library, Ihan thought. Ironically, the actual library of the Magic Academy felt more like a disorganized storage room of a closed company than a proper library. But the Spirit Festival Hall embodied the essence of a library more than the library itself. The path to the tower was neatly paved with bricks, and there was a picturesque pond with a walking path nearby for strolling. The darkness chamber had a pond too, Ihan recalled, though that one was a bubbling, purple pond filled with poison. Standing in front of the door to the Spirit Festival Hall, Gainondo knocked cautiously, then turned to Ihan unsure of what to say, wait, what should I say? Just as it is, Ihan advised, that we're late, because we got hit by an undead? Gainondo hesitated, let me handle it, Professor Millay. We apologize for arriving late, another professor had a prior engagement? If there was a prior engagement, it can't be helped, no need to apologize, Professor Millay responded from within and opened the door descending to the first floor to greet the latecomers, Professor Millay raised an eyebrow upon noticing Ihan. It seemed as though she was surprised to see him there. What? A sense of foreboding washed over Ihan. He wondered if Professor Mortem had spoken to the other professors, instructing them to lose interest in him with amassage like, this one will be my student, so everyone stop paying attention to him? Chapter 80 Fortunately for Ihan, Professor Millay did not send him away upon his arrival. Instead, an unexpected development occurred. Suddenly, two thick books materialized out of thin air. They were so hefty that they could have been mistaken for weapons. The books, bound meticulously, displayed the title, Theoretical Foundations and Cases in Summoning Magic on their covers. Professor Millay, with a commanding presence, instructed, Both of you, sit down? down? She was the kind of person whose stern gaze alone could evoke tension, eliminating any need for a sword or staff, to assert authority. Gainondo, slightly intimidated, quickly found a seat. Curious, he asked, Professor, where are the other students? They have gone back after receiving their lessons and collecting their assignments, Professor Millay replied, Assignments? Gainondo echoed, lifting his head, his tone reflecting his concern. The idea of additional assignments seemed like a significant burden under the current circumstances. He ventured a timid challenge. Professor, isn't dark magic, not part of the assignments? Professor Millie's direct gaze fell upon Gainondo, rendering him completely subdued. Could it be that his gaze has a petrifying effect? Ihan couldn't help but think. Given the peculiar nature of some of the professors, both of you, open the books? Professor Millay commanded, they complied, opening the books to find pages filled with densely written text. The sight seemed to overwhelm Gainondo, who appeared slightly dizzy, read, copy, and solve the problems. The professor instructed, Ihan, looking down at his book, saw the heading of the first chapter, chapter 1, about summoning inanimate objects? Summoning inanimate objects is the most basic and core aspect of summoning magic. Even summoners who are only interested in other areas of summoning must learn and master this part. The great summoner Boltzmann organized educational and efficient magic circles for future generations, and remembering these circles became fundamental in summoning magic. So, young summoners, be thankful and diligent. Memorizing Boltzmann's basic magic circles and understanding their principles will guarantee remarkable achievements in summoning magic, first magic circle, second magic circle, third magic circle, fourth magic circle, young summoners, having learned interesting knowledge, it's now time to use that knowledge in even more interesting ways. Answer the following riddle, the novice summoner, Chursu. While traveling in the cold north, got separated from his group due to an accident, unfortunately, someone had stolen his bag containing thick clothes, and the fierce wind tore apart the clothes he was wearing. What is the quickest summoning magic circle Chursu could use, to avoid freezing to death? 
Ehan found this question to be quite absurd. It seems odd to focus on the magic circle when the culprit should be caught first. He thought the approach was forced, yet he couldn't help but recognize the excellence of the textbook. Having encountered many complex and difficult textbooks, Ehan could appreciate the quality of this one. Not all textbooks were this considerate. Some were designed to cater to the reader's level, while others seemed to aim solely at wasting the reader's time. Unfortunately, most textbooks, and even the professors here, usually fell into the latter category. However, the book given by Professor Millay was a notable exception. It allowed students to easily memorize and understand the basic magic circle compositions used in summoning magic by focusing and reading slowly. This fact alone elevated Professor Millay in Ehan's esteem. She is indeed a good person. Ehan thought Professor Millay had carefully selected the most suitable book for education from numerous magic books, showcasing the mindset of a true educator, a trait that was incomparable to the other professors. Thank you, Professor, Ehan said. His gaze filled with gratitude. Professor Millay, slightly surprised, was taken aback by the emotion in Ehan's eyes. Question mark. There were two primary reasons why Professor Millay was initially hesitant to teach summoning magic to her students. Firstly, she recognized that summoning magic, without sufficient knowledge and preparation, could be hazardous. Even the seemingly simple task of summoning inanimate objects could result in injuries to the caster if not handled with care. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Professor Millay sought to prevent her students from acting recklessly. She was aware that freshmen, often filled with pride and a sense of ego, could easily cause accidents due to their arrogance and lack of experience. She believed that if these students were immediately taught summoning magic, their recklessness could lead to dangerous outcomes. Thus, she made them study, hard and tediously. The studies were so rigorous and challenging that they twisted and contorted the students' bodies, pushing them to their limits. This approach was central to Professor Millie's teaching philosophy. In her view, if a student couldn't endure the rigorous studies and gave up on summoning magic, it was for the best. Such students were deemed better off not learning summoning magic at all, but a sense of surprise overtook Professor Millay as she observed Ehan diligently copying from the book and solving problems without any signs of complaint. Ehan, who was known for his exceptional talent among the students, was expected to be the most arrogant. Yet, while other students soon started yawning, twisting in their seats, and casting longing glances outside, Perhaps planning their escape, Ehan remained an exception. Surprisingly, Ehan sat motionless, absorbed in his studies, with only the sound of his quill breaking the silence. His focus and dedication were unlike his peers. Ehan, Gainando called out suddenly, What? Ehan responded, I need to go to the bathroom, Gainando said, trying to escape. Ehan asked, half joking, What? What? No. No, I'm not. Gainando vehemently denied it, but Ihan, having casually posed the question, now felt sure of his suspicion. He was trying to escape. Ihan had initially thought that Gainando might consider switching from dark magic to summoning magic, given his earlier struggles. However, observing Gainando's current state, it seemed that such a shift might not be necessary after all. I miss Professor Mortem, Gainando later muttered. Almost like a madman, after returning from the bathroom, Gainando's initial hope that hard study might lead to something positive was thoroughly dashed. Professor Millay, unwavering in her approach, had them study rigorously until the very end of the session. Ihan, on the other hand, nodded with a sense of satisfaction. Such lessons are necessary too, he thought, after experiencing several tumultuous classes. This focused, High-quality theoretical study was a welcome change, almost sweet in its nature. As they stood up to leave, Gainanda whispered to Ihan, Hey, do you understand this stuff? Ihan, finding value in the material, replied, Isn't it quite substantial? It's interesting too? Gainanda's expression, a mix of shock and disbelief, 
was more astonished than when Ehan had subdued Raphael. To him, Ehan's engagement with the material seemed almost unfathomable. That's enough for today. Study this material and be ready by next week, Professor Millay announced as she collected the books and handed out a thick bundle of papers. Gainando received them, his expression a mix of respect and resignation. In that moment, both Ehan and Professor Millay foresaw Gainando's future with a similar prediction. He wouldn't show up next week. It seemed obvious given his reaction to the material. See you next week, Ehan said, bidding farewell respectfully. He recognized the importance of maintaining good relationships with professors, especially those of character. Such connections could prove invaluable, perhaps even saving him from potential punishment in the future. I apologize for misjudging you, student Ehan. Professor Millay suddenly remarked, Excuse me? Ehan responded, taken aback, let's meet next week then, Professor Millay said with a faint smile, however, for Ehan, who was left in the dark about the professor's initial judgment, this statement was open to numerous interpretations, what, he wondered, puzzled as the door to the spirit festival hall, closed behind him, he was left contemplating what Professor Millay could have misjudged about him, could it be she discussed my future with Professor Mortem? Surely he didn't say I should only focus on dark magic, right? Or maybe even with the skull principle, Ehan's mind raced with possibilities, leaving him in a state of confusion and contemplation that persisted until he fell asleep that night. As the days passed, the students grew increasingly haggard, while the skull principle seemed to gleam brighter in the eyes. The skull principle entered the basic magic character education classroom with a cheerful voice. Is everyone having a happy week? If it had been the first week, a few students would have politely responded, but now, all students from the four towers remained silent. The skull principal rattled his bones unconcerned, forcing the students' necks to nod up and down involuntarily. All except Ehan, Ehan, after looking around, hastily nodded his head. The skull principal looked at him as if he were absurd. Is he really following along? thought the skull principal, puzzled, the sight of this boy from the warden's family reminded him of a lion wearing a sheep's disguise, trying to befriend other sheep, if he had withstood the principal's magic alone, he should be standing proud and arrogant, not looking like this, now, it's time for the education of your young fledgling mage's characters, you remember the assignment I gave you last week? Right? The students nodded, who could forget? Students of each tower, you were to bring the flag hanging in the freshman lounge of the tower I assigned, remember, the flag with the emblem. The skull principal's assignment was to bring flags from other towers, even with the broadest definition, it had nothing to do with character, but the principal stood confident, let's start with the black tortoise, have you acquired the immortal phoenix flag? Yes, we have, students from the Black Tortoise cautiously began to take out the flag they had exchanged with the Immortal Phoenix. Ah, you brought it, good, the Skull Principal displayed an overtly disinterested expression. He already knew they had exchanged, so it wasn't of much interest to him. The Immortal Phoenix must have taken care of theirs too, right? Yes, good? Now, the Skull Principal with the joy of someone who has been served a long-awaited meal, floated up to the white tiger students, my honorable knights from noble families. You surely have the blue dragon flag, right? Huh? The faces of the white tiger students flushed with humiliation and shame, even Ehan, who normally didn't care what others thought, found the situation a bit uncomfortable, the back of my neck is prickling? Thought Ehan. Feeling uneasy, the white tiger students glared at Ehan with resentful eyes. Why aren't you taking it out? Huh? Why? Don't tell me you didn't bring it. Enough already, Ehan silently wished for the skull principal to stop his antics. Of course, he didn't. The skull principal, having had his fill of fun, changed the topic. As I said before, this lecture isn't about making you fight, the purpose is to get to know each other, become friends, and unite. None of the students believed him, 
it's a pity you misunderstand my intentions, so, for the next assignment, I'll give something easier to understand, Ihan grew anxious, what more could he be planning? There's a lake, if you go west from the main building, some of you might have seen it. That was a lake? Students who had wandered around were confused, saying they thought it was, I thought it was the sea, why would there be a sea inside an academy? Well, I just thought that in this academy, there might be a sea, it was an immensely large lake, as there were deep and rugged mountain ranges difficult to gauge the end of, so too was there a lake in this magic academy, on that lake, there was an island, there. I had hidden a pass for leaving the academy grounds. The students' eyes momentarily flashed, like those of starving beasts, worked together to bring it to me, we understand. This response was the most enthusiastic of any they had given so far. Remember, immortal phoenix students should move together with black tortoise students, and blue dragon students with white tiger students. You're free not to listen, just like the last assignment. But, the skull principal smirked, I assure you, you won't pass if you do that. Students from the blue dragon and white tiger looked at each other and scowled. They all had the same thought, together with these guys? That's what they must be thinking.